Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Thomas Naylor's The Vermont Manifesto, the Second Vermont Republic. Now, uh, I have mixed feelings about this quirky little book. Um, as you can tell, I am actually a supporter of the idea of a Second Vermont Republic, uh, which is essentially the idea that Vermont should withdraw from the United States and set up an independent uh, entity, an independent government, uh, because Vermont is one of two current U.S. states that was at one time its own republic, the other being Texas. There was a California republic movement, but it never really picked up steam in the uh, in the way that Texas and Vermont did, where they were actual functioning governments for a number of years. Vermont uh, was a republic from 1777 to 1791, when it joined the United States as the first state that was not one of the original 13 colonies. So, if I was going to pick one passage that sums up the key argument Naylor is making here, uh, it would be this section here. Although the Green Mountains pale in comparison with the Swiss Alps, Vermonters nevertheless share a number of common values with the Swiss. Independence, self-sufficiency, democracy, hard work, perseverance, and a strong sense of community. Vermont is smaller, more rural, more democratic, less violent, less commercial, more environmentally friendly, more egalitarian, and more independent than most states. Even though Vermont is too small to save our nation from the debilitating effects of separation, alienation, powerless, and spiritual emptiness, it does provide a communitarian alternative to the dehumanized mass production, mass consumption, narcissistic lifestyle which pervades much of the United States. Now, this passage, I think, is interesting because on, on the one hand, it gives you a, a summation of Naylor's core argument. There are existential problems with the United States. There are many, many, many things wrong with the United States as it currently stands or as it stood in uh, the early 2000s when this book was published, specifically 2003. Vermont, on the other hand, with its uh, traditional Vermonter values, represents a more sustainable, more egalitarian, more democratic, um, and, and less militaristic, less capitalistic, etc., etc., alternative to mainstream American culture, to the U.S. government, to the U.S. military-industrial complex, multinational corporations, etc., etc., so, this book is, I would call it, one part curmudgeonly left-wing grievances, and as a leftist, I don't say that to be dismissive of them, because I actually agree with most of the critiques Naylor makes here, even though I ultimately disagree with his conclusion. Uh, so, one part curmudgeonly left-wing critiques, one part bad political philosophy, and a lot of this video is going to be talking about why I think it's bad political philosophy, and two parts travel brochure promoting Vermont, which uh, as someone who got to live in Vermont for two years while doing my master's and who loves the state of Vermont, it was, it was nostalgic for me and made me long for the Green Mountains. Uh, but let's talk uh, politics here. So ultimately, Naylor makes the argument that a Republic of Vermont could be self-sustaining and that because it's smaller and more, um, more unified, more egalitarian, more self-sufficient, more sustainable, etc., etc., than the United States as it currently stands, that a Vermont Republic could be a great model for a better, more sort of spiritually and ethically pure America. There are things I agree with about that claim. 
Uh, I agree with a lot of his critiques, and these are, for the most part, very standard left-wing critiques that he's making. Anti-capitalism, anti-economic globalization, although personally I'm a cosmopolitan, um, and so I believe in um, a, a culturally interconnected world, but I would prefer to see that culturally interconnected world not be based on economic exploitation. And I think Naylor would agree with that perspective, whether or not he supports cosmopolitanism as an ethical philosophy or not, I have no idea. Um, so the anti-capitalist critique, the critique of militarization, especially in 2003, uh, the invasion of Iraq, the invasion of Afghanistan, the Patriot Act, all of these things were drastically and rapidly eroding civil liberties in the US in the name of the military industrial complex. I'm right there with Naylor. These are huge, huge problems. Um, America is partially because of late stage capitalism. Um, America is suffering from affluenza. Um, we're suffering from different uh, economically and culturally based uh, dissatisfactions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, again, Naylor's critiques. I'm right there. I think he. I think he's spot on with most of the critiques that he's making here. The U.S. is not an effective democracy. Uh, in a, in a meaningful sense. Um, it's a representative democracy in principle, but because of the outsized role that money plays in determining elections and in lobbying for particular policies, um, it's not particularly a democratic country. And so this is a huge problem as well. The picture that Naylor paints of Vermont is an idealized one. That's, the, that's one thing that's very, very important to note. The Vermont that Naylor presents is rose-tinted. Uh, it is communitarian, it is uh, independent, it is self-sufficient, it's sus environmentally sustainable, etc., etc. And I'm not saying any of these things are necessarily wrong. Most of the things that Naylor points to about Vermont are correct in, in, to some degree or another. He also, while he acknowledges things like large-scale drug and alcohol abuse, he also ignores a lot of the problems that face Vermont. So that's worth noting in his descriptions of the state. But I think it's ultimately his conclusion that I have an, an issue with. Naylor basically assumes, or would, would assert, I think, that smaller nation states tend to function better than larger ones. He has a big problem with the idea of scale. And he not just with the US, with Russia, with China, with India, um, big, countries, big empires, he thinks that they, they create massive amounts of problems. And he's not necessarily wrong about that. But it's interesting what alternatives he points to and what he does not point to. Um, so one thing he does in this book is he he takes the left-wing critiques of the US government, the military industrial complex and capitalism as though the critiques are the only things that are correct. So for instance, early in the book in the introduction he says any attempt by the federal government to democratize the whole rather than its parts can lead to internal imperialism. This is particularly true of federal social programs such as affirmative action, occupational uh, safety, handicapped education, Medicare, Medicaid, family assistance, and minimum wage laws. Now, there is a validity to this critique, 
but it also ignores the major successes of the U.S. government in dealing with problems that either exist across state lines or that states themselves refuse to deal with. And I'll come back to that because it's, it, it's an important piece that I think he largely ignores. But in Naylor's sort of fetishization of small states, he tends to point to ones that are very stable and that are very economically um, and socially efficient. Switzerland is his number one example. He loves comparing Vermont to Switzerland. And it's not unfair. Right? There's, a, there's much to be said about the connections between Vermont and Switzerland in terms of culture, in terms of ideology, in terms of background, sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. Um, he also tends to go for countries in Scandinavia, um, Sweden and Norway especially, Finland sometimes, Denmark sometimes, Iceland sometimes. When he mentions countries that are not necessarily as beneficial to his argument, he tends to gloss over the ways in which they are problematic. So, for instance, at one point he says, uh, he's talking about the, the breakup of larger polities into smaller ones. So he, said, he says here, as a result of the dissolution of Yugoslavia, Slovenia, Croatia, Serbia, and Bosnia have all become independent nations as well. He leaves out, and I think this is pertinent, that the breakup of Yugoslavia was accompanied by genocide the Bosnian genocide in the early 1990s, ethnic tensions in Serbia, in Yugoslavia, or in, uh, in Slovenia, in Croatia, in Bosnia, um, in Herzegovina. <laughs> That's not a fantastic example if your argument is it's better for larger political organizations to break up because that was genocidal. And in fact, like I'm a, I support post-colonialism. I'm a, I work on post-colonial literature. I, I support post-colonial philosophy and theory. A lot of post-colonial nations have become military dictatorships, have been racked by civil war, have seen ethnic, religious, or racial genocides. So, Naylor glosses over that in ways that I think are incredibly problematic. He also, at one point, refers to the, the, the paradigm shift which peacefully brought down forced racial segregation in the American South, apartheid in South Africa, and communism in the Soviet Union, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and other Eastern European countries. Maybe Naylor doesn't know about all of the violence involved in the civil rights movement and the anti-apartheid movement. But to call those peaceful is incredibly problematic. I mean, admittedly, the majority of violence was directed against civil rights activists, anti-apartheid activists, etc., etc. But to pretend that these were peaceful things is, I think, at the very least, a problematic misrepresentation of what actually occurred in these historical circumstances. And so this is one of my big problems with Naylor's argument, is his history is bad, often, I think, misleadingly so with the purpose of pushing his particular ideological agenda in this book, even if the actual examples that he's giving, in a way, problematize that, that ideological agenda. And the other big one, he talks here, he says, in the divisive 1860s, the Confederate states tried unsuccessfully to lead our nation into disunion. 
and then he goes on. There is a pro-Confederate element here, and I personally have a, a, a fairly visceral reaction to that because when I was in high school, I was a lost causer. And then I actually started learning about the Civil War, and I started learning about the actual causes of it from legitimate historical sources and not lost cause mythology. One of the arguments that that Naylor makes in this book is pro-democratic and pro-egalitarian, and I would put those in the same camp. I think you can't have a meaningful democracy without an egalitarian society or a relatively egalitarian society. The Confederate States of America was the exact antithesis of this, and you can fight me on this in the comments if you want to, but you will be wrong. The Confederate States of America was founded, according to the Confederate States of America, on the principles of racial inequality. They were founded on the principle that whites are superior to blacks. That is what the Confederates said. They said that in a number of their secession documents. Uh, there's a famous quote by the vice president of the Confederacy where he overtly says this. It's across Confederate generals, officers, enlisted men. It's across their writings, in letters, in diaries. It's extraordinarily well documented. The Confederacy was built on the idea of racial inequality, which is fundamentally anti-democratic. You add to this that all, almost all of the critiques that lost causers tend to make of the Union and of Abraham Lincoln apply equally well, if not more so, to the Confederacy. They instituted a draft before the United States did. The Confederate government suspended habeas corpus many more times than Abraham Lincoln and the U.S. government did, etc., etc. This is so all if you're going to point to the Confederacy as an argument for breaking up the United States, you don't get to also make the claim that you want that to be democratic. The Confederacy was anti-democratic. I'm sorry, but there it is. Which brings me to my other concerns with Naylor's political philosophy, because he envisions Vermont independence as being a model for the larger scale breakup of the United States. And to be clear, in some ways, I'm not opposed to that. I don't think there's anything mystical or transcendent about the United States that would prevent us from ever breaking up as a country. And to be honest, I would love to live in the Vermont Republic. Uh, sign, sign me up today. But Naylor repeatedly makes the point that Vermont is a unique state. And I think this is one of the huge problems with his argument that Vermont could be, a, the Vermont Republic could be a model for other states. If Vermont is the exception and it is, it, and it could be a sustainable republic because it's the exception, then you have a, a contradictory problem there in arguing that other states or other regions should also seek independence. And if your goal, and Naylor is a leftist, I have no reason to question his leftist credentials. If Naylor supports democracy, egalitarianism, sustainability, it's not necessarily a great argument to say that the country as a whole should break up. And I, I give you two major reasons for this. One is the rights of minorities. Naylor says here, like Sweden, Vermont consistently earns high praise for the way it treats women, children, minorities, gays, and lesbians. Of course, it's easy to treat minorities well when there are so few of them and they are perceived to be a threat to no one. Whether or not that's why Vermonters are egalitarian and open to others is a is a question I'm not going to wade into, but you take, rather than Vermont, 
Texas, Alabama, Georgia, Florida, run by the Republicans who currently run those states. How long do you reckon African Americans keep their rights? How long do you reckon LGBT people keep their rights? Women keep reproductive rights? Non-Christians keep rights to religious expression under those current Republican governors? I'm guessing minutes. You don't have the egalitarian commitment of Vermonters in much of the country. So that's a huge problem. Like if you want, if you are envisioning a system that is more democratic and more egalitarian than the current United States, you have to acknowledge the fact that historically much of what ensures civil rights in this country, as often as the federal government has failed egregiously, state and local polities have failed much more egregiously. The federal government has often been the, the force that ensures that civil rights are actually provided for when state and local governments don't want to do that. that. Particularly when the people who run those state and local governments are white, property-owning, male, Christian, heterosexuals. Um, and the thing is, you could, de in an independent republic of Texas or of Florida, you could democratically strip away all of these rights, provided that these uh, republic governments narrow the franchise, cut African Americans out of the voter rolls, and it becomes much easier to elect a government that will strip African Americans of their rights. We're already seeing this going on in many states in the U.S. and the federal government, to a certain extent, not entirely as effectively as one would hope, is attempting to resist this. The other problem with Naylor's let's break up the country into a bunch of independent republics theory is a practical one, uh, an e a practical economic problem. Vermont is prob would probably be fine. According to Naylor, in 2003, uh, for every dollar that Vermont put into the federal coffers, it took a dollar and 12 cents. Some states, New York, California, Connecticut, I think Texas is on this list, put more money into the federal government than they get back. They would probably be fine as independent republics. Economically, not a problem. They would even get a boost to their, their local economies. On the other hand, states like Kentucky and West Virginia take out more money than they put in. So if you take a state like West Virginia, for instance, and again, I love West Virginia. I got my bachelor's and my doctorate there. They get a lot more in federal funding than they put into the federal government. If you suddenly eliminate that money, the state economy collapses. If you eliminate Social Security, you eliminate Medicare and Medicaid, you eliminate um, WIC and SNAP benefits and things like this, you eliminate federal pensions, federally guaranteed pensions, the state economy simply doesn't survive. So again, Vermont may be the exception, but the fact that it's the exception means that it's unlikely that other states are going to be able to follow that example. In order to make every other state or even every other region of the country sustainable and function in the way that Vermont functions would need massive reconstruction, massive reconfiguring of the economy and of the culture of those different areas in ways that it's really not feasible. So I think there's, I, I think Naylor, his critiques 
of U.S. culture, government, military, industrial complex, international capitalism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, are all valid. I think his ideals are good. Other than an independent Republic of Vermont, I just don't see them playing out successfully anywhere else in the U.S.